So welcome to Ratio Christi. This is a continuation of last week and we're gonna clarify some things I think that need clarifying. Um, this is reconstructing what it means to be human. Remember last week <clears throat> we deconstructed transhumanism's philosophy of mind and, and human persons. Or you could say tonight is the ultimate slugfest as Katie has dubbed us. So these were, this was our takeaway from last week. Transhumanism's philosophy of mind in human persons doesn't adequately account for human persons because it excludes first-person conscious reasoning and the enduring identity of the self. So I, 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 we covered a lot, and I left out some things that I think would be Il good illustrations to help us grasp Peirce's argument a little better. And we're going to cover them tonight since we didn't do it last week. Um, their thought experiments, there are two that I think are helpful. Mary's Room and the Chinese Room. So this is Mary's Room, and this is Frank Jackson's argument that kind of solidifies what we were talking about last week about the inadequacies of a physicalist view of the mind. So Mary, let's pr so this is the thought experience. You have to get in, the, get in the thinking of it. Mary is a brilliant physicist who for, for whatever reason is forced to live and work in a black and white windowless lab. She studies for all her life. What? She's a grad student, yes. She only, only she's done this all her life. So she studies vision, specifically the way humans see colors. And she's obtained all the physical facts about what goes on when we see colors, red, blue, etc. She discovers just which wavelength combinations stimulate the retina, all of the, all of the physical facts. So. When Mary is released from her lab, will she learn anything more about colors, or how humans see colors? It seems obvious that she will learn something else about herself, the world, and the human visual experience. Even though Mary had all the physical facts about seeing colors, her knowledge was incomplete because human beings aren't entirely physical. So Mary had the first person experience of seeing color when she got out of that windowless black and white room. Okay? So that's a good ex thought experiment, right? Does that, and that, that's very basic. And, and um, Frank Jackson, he, he kind of focuses on the epistemological part of it, but actually John, uh, John Searle says that actually it's ontological because the, the exper first person experience is an ontologically different than studying third person physical facts about vision. Anyway, does that help at all? Is that good? The, the next one is probably even more related to what we were talking about. This is, is to illustrate just the difference between first person experience versus yeah. knowledge. Mm -hmm. And, and that they're two different things. You can know everything physical about something objectively, and still, there, you're, if you're leaving the subject or the self out of it, there's, there's something else. The world isn't just physical facts, in other words. So the Chinese room, this is John Searle's thought experiment that's been around for almost 40 years, so uh, it stood the test of time. And I think it is... Uh, related to Peirce's argument. Peirce, Charles Peirce's argument is more fundamental and tells why the Chinese room thought experiment um, works, so to speak. So a person who doesn't know Chinese is locked in a room and given a large batch of Chinese writing. See the little guy? He's right here. See? Kind of got a weird head though, doesn't he? and he's got a ponytail. But anyway, <laughs> he's equipped with a pencil and a piece of paper and a rule book in English for formally manipulating Chinese symbols in terms of syntax, remember, not their semantics, not what they mean. Okay, y'all stop looking at Andrew, he's, <laughs> he, or he's gonna fall. The symbols passed into the room are called questions and the symbols he passes back out of the room from following the rule book, his handy dandy rule book, which is what you see there in yellow, are the answers to the questions. The person in the room is able to simulate the behavior of a person who understands Chinese because he gives the correct answers to Chinese questions. But all the same, the person locked in the room does not understand a word of Chinese. 
So think it, what it's supposed to illustrate is Charles Peirce's um, semiotics, that thinking and understanding is something more than just symbols. There has to be meanings attached to the symbols. So does that help you, Sam? Because I know you were iffy on the last week. Does that help? You like the Chinese room? Yes. You better, than, better than the thought experiment last week, just because I, I feel like the statement, this person does not understand Chinese, is incontrovertible. Right. I still need to think more about this. OK. Well, um, and people have about, thought about it for 40 years, so it's OK for you to think about it. <laughs> yeah. So this is our roadmap tonight. Um, we want to understand the landscape of views of what it means to be human in philosophy and also in biblical theology. So in the academy, let's see if I have, oh, here's my resources. So um, this is a great book on the brief history of the soul. Um, this, I, I really used probably the most resources that I used was the substance dualism. Um, and I used the Bible. <laughs> And uh, later on, when we get into the theology part, uh, N.T. writes, the resurrection of the Son of, Son of God is a good resource. Okay. So in the academy, all disciplines have developed to now, in modern times, in your times, in, the, in your discipline, uh, embrace the philosophy of scientific materialism, really since this developed since the scientific revolution. But it really wasn't the case as it relates to philosophy of mind until about the 20th century. So how did it come to be pro the prominent view that they began to uh, adopt the materialist view of the world to human persons? Used to be there was a law of physics for a thing, but human persons were excluded and the mind was excluded. But that changed in the 20th century. But since at least as early, so the, a little bit of the history, I like this stuff, so if y'all are bored, just go, okay, skip this. But I like to see why we came to where we are. So since at least as early as Francis Bacon, there was a shift from the classical Aristotelian metaphysics to modern scientific materialism. For example, instead of understanding reality in terms of whole substances with internal forms and teleology, the modern scientific mechanistic view of the world understands reality in terms of molecules, atoms, electrons, quarks, etc., all moving um, to the laws of nature, which can be stated in mathematical formulas. It's very handy dandy. All causes are efficient physical causes based on mechanisms. Mechanism. To be clear, there are obviously material causes, but to reduce all of causation to only physical causes isn't, isn't reasonable, I would say, I suggest. So for a while, Christian philosophers and scientists still held that God was the final cause, right? So they still held out that God was the final cause. But later thinkers, and we're thinking after Descartes, after Pascal, they finally deleted God as the final external cause. And with God out of the picture, it was seemed very plausible, uh, well, with God out of the picture, to understand the mind as an immaterial substance or an immaterial thing was also excluded. So there's no immaterial in the world. There's no angels, there's no God, there's no afterlife, everything is physical. So um, it seemed very plausible to believe that the mind would yield to a purely physical explanation. And granted, the discoveries and legitimacy, legitimacy of the sci scientific worldview for 400 years has just bolstered that view, right? So that philosophers and scientists continue down the mechanistic materialist path, attempting to give everything a purely materialistic explanation in order to complete the scientific view of the world, image of the world. However, this doesn't mean that philosophy of mind has been settled in favor of materialism. There's still, to this day, as you can see, ongoing debates. But even so, uh, all the debates going on, some version of materialism has been the paradigm view of philosophy of mind in the 20th century. So the first in the early 20th century was behaviorism. That was the theory of the philosophy of mind. And, it, and this is like, think of 
think of the Turing test. Think of Alan Turing. This is how the, the culture or the, the paradigm that he grew up in. It emphasizes outward behavioral aspects of thought and dismisses the inward experiential subjective aspects of conscious thought. It's a little like functionalism, but it's more severe. So the identity theory was, it came about. So then they, then they said, no, that's not, that's not right. So the identity theory came into play in the mid 20th century. And that was just very reductionist, that mental states and processes are identical to brain states. They reduced to, to brain states and, process, and physical processes. But that had some problems too, because you know they're leaving a lot out when they have a, the reductionist theory wasn't, wasn't the, the end all to end all. So then came functionalism, and this was in, the, in about the 1970s and is the paradigm view in philosophy of mind now. It's much like behaviorism. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, a happy medium between the two because um, mental states are identified by what they do rather than what they are made of. So they're not reduced to brain states, but mental states can be multiply realized. Brain states can be, can be um, uh, reduced to computation and algorithm for a computer. So for example, oh here, mental states are not reduced to only to brain states, but can be reduced to computational algorithms. So they're multiply realized. And this came about you, really when AI was born. So multiple, uh, so, and I have down here, remember Jerry Fedor last time, this was his, his explanation of the causal closure of the world. Physics determines chemistry, determines biology, determines brain science, determines mental states. So that's kind of the, the, the framework that physicalist theories need to adhere to, the causal closure of the physical. So uh, keep that in mind because it's very hard for them to keep a physicalist view if they're going to recognize that mental states are different, that they have a different properties or, you know, that they're, that they're very different from brain states. So um, I have to say that, I mean, I'm, and this is not just for me, but materialist theories fail to capture the basic aspects of the mind. It's what we've been talking about. First person consciousness, rational thought, reasoning, understanding, grasping, um, understanding meaning, intentionality, unity of consciousness, the self, the subject, you, I, and enduring identity. So those are the things that plague third person objective scientific theories of the mind. Um, and even, you know, they recognize it. So I'm not, I'm not telling, they're, I'm not saying anything new. John Searle himself, who is not, uh, he's not a dualist by any means. He's not a Christian. He's, he's a secular philosopher, says, the most striking feature is how much of mainstream philosophy of mind of the past 50 years seems obviously false. I believe there's no other area of contemporary analytic philosophy where so much is said that is so implausible. In the philosophy of mind, obvious facts about the mental, such as what we all really do, that we all really do have subjective conscious mental states, and that they are not eliminable in favor of anything else, are routinely denied by many, perhaps most, of the advanced thinkers on the subject. So he's lamenting. He's saying it's inadequate. The same for Thomas Nagel, and he gets a lot of flack for it, too. I don't think John Searle gets a lot of flack, and he says the same thing. The concepts of physical uh, science provide a very special and partial description of the world that experience reveals to us. It is the world with all subjective consciousness, sensory appearances, thought, values, purpose, and will left out. What remains is the mathematically describable order of things and events in space and time. I believe the reductionist project is doomed, that conscious experience, thought, value, and so forth are not illusions, in, in, even though they cannot be identified with physical facts. So the route to go, if you're, if you're going to poke the bear and say, something's wrong, we've got to do something different, the only other thing that, that uh, philosophers do is they say, well, these things just are illusions. They don't exist. You, you thinking that, you have, that you're a subject self, a person, uh, that you have consciousness, will, 
intentionality, meaning, those things are just illusions. So <laughs> Galen Strawson, he's a character. Did you, we talk about characters, right? Galen Strawson calls this the great silliness. He says, when it comes to conscious experience, there's a rock bottom sense in which we're fully acquainted with it just in having it. The having is the knowing. So when people say that consciousness is a mystery, they're wrong because we know what it is. It's the most familiar thing there is, however hard it is to put it into words. So, I mean, he, we can talk about like what Thomas Nagel and Galen Strauss and what they're, what they're moving towards is a view that we're not going to discuss tonight, but we can talk about. It's called panpsychism, but it's, it's even different than what we're talking about. Okay, so because of the pressure on materialist views that they're not adequate, there have become other views that got to go to work, right, to figure out what can we say about mental states. Uh, so these uh, other, and they're not just these views. These are these are the probably the the most popular um, non-standard physicalist views. I didn't put all the ones on here because, of course. We don't have time. But um, what they want to do, remember, what are they trying to do? They need to account for the mental states that are different from brain states and the subject who has them, the self. So the subject, the mental subject, and the mental states are what they're trying to describe or explain in their, in their um, non-standard physicalist uh, theories. And some, so some have come very close to acknowledging mental causation. Now, um, supervenient physicalism, let's, let's, just, let's just first talk about the first thing, and not very many people probably hold this one these days, but have you ever seen those ink dot drawings? So that's, what, that's, what, that's what that little drawing is. So there's an image, right? And it's all made of little ink dots. So the Im if the ink dot changed, the image would change. So the image is supervenient on the little dots on the page, right? There's no mi so on supervenience, it would be like foam on the ocean wave. The foam is supervenient on the wave. Or I don't have a I don't have another one. Uh, it's not wetness to H2O, H2O, that's more like emergent. But there's no mental difference without a physical difference. So on the image, the image will change only if there's a change in the physical dots on the page, okay? If the physical facts are fixed, if the ink dots are fixed, then the image is fixed. The supervenient image is fixed. But then... Are the mental states, is the supervenient mental states doing anything? Can the, mental, can, the, can the image change the dots? No. So on this, it's called epiphenomenal. So mental states on, on this view are epiphenomenal, meaning they don't do anything. They don't cause anything. There's no mental causation. Mental states don't do anything, only the physical underneath. So there's no causal contribution. So it, it, it doesn't really do, that theory doesn't, you know, get anybody going. It's not, it, it's, not very, um, it's not very plausible. The next one is emergent physicalism. There's weak and strong. If it's strong, what they would want to say is mental states do, ha do have some causation. If it's weak, it's almost like supervenient. But if it's strong, um, it means that the mental states are actually uh, have a causal contribution. But I would say to an emergent physicalist who has, has a strong view, is that in line with physicalism then? Because remember what, what it is, the physics fixes all the facts. So if they're going as far as saying that mental states have mental causation, they're going away from material, the materialist view of the mind. They're actually going more, they're, they're straying. So they're, in a, they're, not, <laughs> they're not sticking with like Jerry Fedor's uh, 
physics fix all the, fixes all the facts. And at what point are these types of theories not, not representative of physicalism at all? They they're, can't even say they're, they're non-standard physicalist views. They're non-standard views. So it seems that what they're saying is uh, consciousness and thoughts emerge from our biology, but then once they've emerged from our biology, they can have causal, causal. That kind of sounds like picking yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah, yeah, and well, one of the things it's it's very um, it's not ad hoc, but it but that's kind of what may, that's the, your gut kind of going. Well, why that they, they don't ever explain why mental subjects emerge from the matter, you know. Why would that be the case on your story, on your physicalist story? It seems not, there, there's not a plot, they don't have a plausible explanation of why. It's more like a brute fact. So they want to say, they, you know, and my gosh, we would say that it's very good that they want to acknowledge that mental states and that there is a mental subject, right? We're going, well, that's good. You're not, you're not saying it's an illusion. But all the same, it doesn't adequately explain um, things. But it's interesting. So, what's on, so what can be on the table now? All, things, all kinds of things can be on the table now if they're going to acknowledge mental states and mental subjects. Theism is a plausible competing view then on, on, in our world now. It's on the table because if God exists, if, if God exists, there is a reality that has always included a conscious mind with intrinsic subjectivity, intentional states, and goal-directed rationality, God. And then the existence of finite beings like us with similar minds is much more to be expected on theism than on a materialist view. So if, if God's back on the table, this makes more sense. Even an emergent view makes more sense than a, than, um, a strictly physicalist view. So, uh, so the little cartoon says, can we see that trick again, please? Yeah, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a, like a parlor trick. Okay, so here we are. So we are turning the corner, we're gonna turn the corner and discuss some of the, there's various dualist views now that are on the table. So we've, we've talked about the inadequacies, there's some non-standard physicalist views out there, and now we're gonna talk about dualist views. So, um, I, this has brought, what's so funny? Oh, yeah, I think. So everybody thinks when, when they think of dualism, they often just go, oh, hand wave away, we're talking about Descartes, he's already been, um, he's already been shut down. But um, <laughs> that, what, what the, what the inadequacy of materialist views has done for everyone to reinvestigate dualist views broadly. So what we're talking about broadly is, wait a minute, did I skip one? No. Okay. So there's a lot more than these three, I have to say. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot more than these three. But because of time, I chose these three. There's William Hasker's emergent dualism, which is interesting because it's, it, it's the dualist version of the emergent physicalism, right? So they have some overlap. They can actually come to the table and talk both of those views, especially the strong one. And then, so William Hasker's view is that a substantial Spatially extended immaterial self subject emerges from the functioning of the brain and nervous system. But once it emerges, it exercises its own causal powers, like Sam said, and continues to be sustained by God after death. That's Hasker's view. Um, a Cartesian, Cartesian type dualism. I didn't put it on here. Charles Telefero and Richard Swinburne has a Cartesian view. So on their view, human persons consist of two substances, a soul, the essential part, and a body, the inessential part. And it's possible for the soul to exist after the death of the body and be joined again to a resurrection body. What makes the body my body is its connection with my soul. So the soul's continued existence after my death 
makes possible the resurrection of a body which is mine. If, if, if you're wondering, is, is the resurrected me, the real me, is still me type of thing. Um, and so, Chris, <laughs> you made fun of this Thomistic type dualism. So we're taking, just talking broadly. So Ed Fazer has Aquinas' view, and J.P. Moreland, that's what he calls his view, Thomistic type dualism. But just broadly, the human soul is the substantial form of the living human body. So there's not two substances. So remember Cartesian, there's two substances to a person, a, a, a body and mind, but there's two substances. On Thomistic type dualism, the human soul is a substantial form of the living human body, a body that has both corporeal and incorporeal operations. The survivalist view, as opposed to the cor corruptionist view, is that the human being persists in existence after death, though only constituted by his soul in an incomplete form. The body is essential to the human person. Remember on a uh, Cartesian view, they said the body's not essential. But on the Aquinas' view, the body is essential to the human person in his ultimate mature state. An enduring personal identity is rooted in the soul. Okay? So just to summarize, the things materialists leave out are the very things that the dualist philosophies of human persons are trying to explain. Okay, is that good? Was that too broad? But, but, but was that clear? Uh, you mentioned something panpsychism earlier. Is that also dualism? No. Panpsychism is the view. <clears throat> it's, it's, a, it's a view. I wouldn't put it in, in any category. <laughs> but it's that consciousness is in all matter. And can em that's why it can emerge. But it's a kind of a wonky view. We could talk about it later. And I don't know. I don't, not, uh, I'm not an expert in panpsychism. But uh, the two that I told you, Galen Strawson and um, the other guy, not John Searle, they are going towards, their, their view is going towards panpsychism. That's what they've landed on. Katie, do you know about it? It's like Buddhism 2.0. It's what? Buddhism 2.0. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Buddha. Maybe, yeah. Okay. So, substance dualism, broadly speaking, even all three of those that are different um, affirm the, these things. There is a self, a soul that is immaterial. That self is not identical to the body. And personal identity is rooted in the soul. So all of those, e even the, all those dualist views agree on these things. Can you tell that um, Zach shushed up my slides? <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. <laughs> I got back on my slides this afternoon and I went, oh, this looks really great. Who did this? <laughs> Okay, so now we're getting to your handy dandy handout. The reason I gave you the handout is because there's a bunch of verses on there that I knew you wanted explanations for, and they're not on the slides, so you can have them on your handout. Um, so let's just go through three terms. Biblical anthropology is just the understanding of human nature implied by all the relevant data of Scripture in its context. Holistic just means humans are an integrated unity of body and soul, and it affirms it's not platonic, nor is it Gnostic. So it affirms the goodness of the body and distinctness of the soul. And dualism just means that God created and redeems humans as embodied persons. He sustains us disembodied between death and bodily resurrection. So as, you know, what was the term that Jackson used in his Trinity presentation about the room being dimly lit. Can we talk about adumbration a little bit? That's it, adumbration. So it's like the Old Testament verses. There's a very, very nicely done. I was trying to remember that today. Okay. Um, um, to interpret the verses in the Old Testament, I... Th I, I I would say this loosely, we're going to get, we're going to come to some general conclusions, but not, 
be dogmatic about it. So um, in the Old Testament, of course, Genesis 2-7 expresses generic dualism in that a body is formed from the earth, an intrinsic God-given source of life, consciousness, and agency is breathed by God into the body. Okay? So it's just inferring a dualism. That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying about that. Psalm 23.6, also we can infer, the psalmist says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It just implies continu- continuity of identity in the afterlife, you could say. And y'all can, I, I mean, I'm not emphatic on any of these. I'm just trying to give you kind of the landscape of the Bible. And that's what this, this uh, what I was reading wasn't a, I'm no theologian. It was a theologian I was reading, but he wasn't giving a detailed hermeneutics of all this. He was doing broad strokes as well. So 1 Samuel 28, which Sam brought up like the witch of Endor. Did you bring that up last week? Yeah. Um, it's where... Uh, Samuel is called up by a medium because Saul wants to uh, ask Samuel some questions. Do you all know the story? Uh, He wasn't getting answers from God. And Samuel does appear and prophesies Saul's death to him. Speaks and appears. Uh, they, They obviously recognize him, you know. Um, Isaiah, which, which you can infer that his person and his body that was buried miles away aren't the same thing. Um, Isaiah 26, 19 uh, is a prophecy, your dead will live, their corpses will rise, just about final resurrection. And there's a lot of talk about final resurrection in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 37, the same, Ezekiel's vision of the resurrection of the faithful dead. So Generally, what, what they conclude, what this theologian concluded from the Old Testament summary was that there is a two-stage eschatology. There's life after death, and then there's resurrection life after that. So it's in two stages. Personal pronouns refer to the dead, and there's lots of terms that have multiple meanings, and interpretation is very difficult. <laughs> That's what I got out of it. I mean, you can, you can slice these up and, and look at it a lot, but I, I felt like y- using word studies and all that in the Old Testament would be very, very difficult, especially because I'm not a theologian. So I, I think we can get general conclusions, but not anything real specific. So Second Temple Judaism. Um, Jim, quick oh, question. What? Um, so thinking about the Old Testament, yeah. clearly in like the first century, the Jewish, you know, in the Jewish milieu. Yeah, we're about to get to that. Okay. Well, yeah. Really. What, what, what they believe specifically? Yeah. Well, I'm just saying yeah. there was a debate about this. Oh, right. Exactly. Oh, well, true. So in the, there are three main views represented in Second Temple, just like Andrew's saying, in Second Temple Judaism. There's... The Sadducees, see, they're so sad, you see. You see? <laughs> Did y'all ever learn that? Oh, was, they're so sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. Okay, it's because there's no afterlife and there's no resurrection. Philo, who followed, who studied Plato, he believed in disembodied immortality, but not, not platonic in that he, it wasn't, he didn't, um, devalue the body. It was just that this was his view, disembodied immortality, not embodied in in eternity. But temporary disembodiment between death and resurrection were the Pharisees and the rabbis. This was their view, that that you you lived between your death and resurrection in a a, um, disembodied state. Sam? Uh, In the disembodied immortality, one of the books listed here is Wisdom of Solomon. Yeah. But if I'm not mistaken, it... Uh, I don't know if that was for that view. Uh, That's for all... Oh, temporary disembodied... Oh, wait a minute. That's not for the disembodied immortality. That's for temporary disembodiment. Oh, okay. Oh, interesting. I don't remember that. But, yeah. Oh, is it, oh it's listening, but... Yeah. Yeah, well, probably different verses. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. 
What were you going to say? Because uh, if I'm remembering Ben's Deuterocanon oh. uh, meaning correctly, the uh, Wisdom of Solomon is part of the Catholic canon, is it? But it is given a high level somewhere? No, it's, it's okay, Ecclesiastes. It yeah. 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 Right. And there's also disagreement. One thing, but among these three groups here, there would be disagreement on which books are part of the canon and which books are not. Yeah. Um, I mean that. So I'm sure that. I think for this study, he just took a, took every everything he could get in that time period to see what what the views were. Um. So for the second summary of the Second Temple Judaism, there is still the two. You know. There's still two-stage eschatology um, that was believed. So what, what, and I have to tell you that the guy that I read was John Cooper. What's his name? John W. Cooper. But almost all of his stuff references N.T. Wright's book. And I think N.T. Wright ha has the most recent good scholarship on uh, what these views are throughout the entire Old Testament, Second Temple Judaism, and New Testament. So if in, do, do any of you have that book, The Resurrection of the Son of God? I mean, I have it, but it's a lot of scholarship on this. And so this guy, Cooper, I would say he, he used N.T. Wright almost exclusively. Um, and he, is, so N.T. Wright says that most Jews around the turn of the Common Era believed in that generic two-stage eschatology. God sustains people between death and the final resurrection, and personal identity was guaranteed between physical death and physical re-embodiment at the resurrection. Okay, so then we get to the New Testament. And there's more verses in this. I gave you, you know, as many as I could. <clears throat> the modification from Second Temple Judaism and Old Testament is that Jesus was raised first and believers will follow. So that's new information that they didn't have, right? So Jesus raised first, believers follow at his return, and a, a little bit more information about the resurrection body. The resurrection body is the earthly body transformed by God's spirit and not merely re revivified, revived, okay? So Matthew 10, 28, uh, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, so distinguishing between those two. And then Jesus yielded up his, yielded up his spirit. Some would say, well, no, he just breathed his last but uh, I think in Matthew, it actually says, yielded up his spirit. And spirit is both the breath of life and the person who survives death on, on this term, this word. Mark 9, 2 thir through 13 is the transfiguration. And Moses and Elijah show up and appear with Jesus. And then uh, Luke 20 Jesus is talking and he's saying, God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And that was Moses referring to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus saying to the thief on the cross in Luke 23, 43, today you shall be with me in paradise. And then Paul, so not only Jesus, not only the gospel writers, but also Paul affirms the Pharisees' belief in the resurrection of the dead when he is is uh, discussing these things. And he, I, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, is a good verse for the holistic, inferring holistic view of man. May God sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want me to go on? Do you have a favorite? Well, I think they changed the scripture to the What? 5.123. <laughs> oh. What did you say? I do oh. think creating the scripture is a little bit ad hoc, First but that's okay. Five, five, is that wrong? There's an extra one. On the Not on the handout. Only on the slide. Oh, 123. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, well, I'll correct that later. I, I, I corrected on the handout. What was my problem? <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do you think it infers? Uh, I wouldn't be 
so bold. That but, he continued uh, between his he, death and, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, and Jesus also. So you would say that Jesus didn't go extinct between his death and resurrection. Um, yeah, that's to me something else by dualism. I'm not sure how you infer dualism. Again, I'm still not sure what you mean by dualism in some of these, con in some of these contexts. Um, I'm not sure how you infer dualism from any of, uh, of from the verses you cited. Just the distinction between um, yeah. body and soul, or, or person. So the, I mean, there's a distinction, but what, how does that come? How does that produce a philosophical theory of dualism about? There's two things about you, your body and your soul, that are distinct. So it's not really dualism. It's just two things. It's just dual things. Uh, for a Cartesian, it would be two substances, but not for Aquinas. Right, but I'm only saying from biblical. From, the from Bible, biblical. I don't think the Bible, there's a dual substance theory. Here. Uh, I think I think we're, we're it's more broad. Yeah. There, we're not inferring dualism, but we are inferring those Thanks. types of things, yeah, that would support dualism, okay. yeah. So then that's why we just go back to, like, I'm not sure what you mean by dualism, then, in this kind of context. In the biblical context? Yeah. Well, uh, that you are not your body. You are not in your body entirely. You're yeah. a composite body and soul. Yes. And, and the soul can live without the body. Would it be more accurate to say it's not you are not your body, but you are more than your body? Right. Would that be a better? But the, but the distinction, of course, is that you your soul can survive, yeah. has the ability to survive, the body. Even like emergent physicalism says that you are something more than your body because your body has this like emergent property, but this is a little bit more than that. Mm -hmm. You're saying that it really is this sort of distinct thing that exists separate from your body. And Whereas has ca causal all power, these right? Are saying something more than that. Yeah, yeah. Well, the summary would be: biblical anthropology reflects a view of human nature that is both holistic and he he says du uh, Cooper would say dualist. And actually, I don't think N.T. Wright says dualism. So if that makes you feel any better. He's too smart for that. Yeah. What? He's too smart for that. Yeah, he's too smart for that. Although, although none of what he says would would conflict with. Right, what we're saying. Uh, God created, redeem, creates, redeems, and will glorify humans as whole embodied persons. And God sustains persons, uh, their soul, apart from their bodies between death and resurrection. That would be pro probably what I would call the dualist part of it, Christianus. You know, that there would have to be some dualism there. Incorporeal, incorporeal aspects of the person and soul. So there's, there's no evidence, so there's other views out there, right, that we didn't discuss, but there's no evidence for the immediate resurrection view, which is bodily res resurrection immediately at death, or the extinction recreation view, a period of non-existence between death and general resurrection. And those, those are views, you know, those are out there on the table. I mean, so they're... When we're talking about a dualist philosophy derived say uh, the, the soul is not entirely dependent on the body for its existence. Uh, they are distinct. Um, uh, it seems like there are a few things that we can say that are philosophically relevant. So I'm not sure what you were saying earlier that well, we're talking there's about no philosophy derived from any of these verses. I'm not saying there's no philosophy derived from any of these verses. I'm just saying it's not. If, if we're talking about anthropology, we're talking about what is the human person. But I don't, I, there is no dualism in the def, in my understanding of what the Bible thinks a human person is. I mean, yeah, there's a soul and it's a body, but that's. I mean, it doesn't have that term. I, mean, I, I would say. Dualism, I'm going to say, just means there's two substances. That's why I think, the, the, you know. Oh, uh, but, but, but even, even Aquinas' view is, is, no, it's, it's not. Well, I mean, some people call it a form of dualism. I know. I know. I know. I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but but I mean, you can't deny there's Thomistic dualism. But I mean, it's in that camp. But you're right. There's one substance. Not two. I already talked about that. Well, what is the substance? Can I ask you? In, in okay. Yeah. I don't have that all. I know. <laughs> this, a substance. This sounds 
a lot like it. The issue is mostly definitions. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, yeah. it's not really. It's not well, really. Like when ben. The dualism, we're saying is Thomas. Is that's what, that's so at the bottom, is, what, is, what is counted as dualism or not? At Who's bottom, like we would agree. Tom, Thomas Aquinas and other dualists would agree that God sustains the soul of the person apart from their bodies between death and resurrection, even though it's incomplete. And, to, and Thomas Aquinas would say it's very incomplete, and we would too. That the disembodied state is not our end state, right? Um, but but that would be the, the and, and even Ed Fazer talks about the incorporeal and the corporeal part of the soul. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's what you the could, part of the soul? yeah, like perception, it, it, it depends on the body, but some things like thinking and other things don't depend on the body. It seems, though, that if one can exist without the other, we are referencing two distinct things. Yeah, um, mind you that God... God, uh, God is part of that sustaining in the disembodied state because that's not our that's not our normal state as a human person. Okay. Yeah. Ben's got his hand up for the I, longest. Yeah. Time. Okay. So yeah, Ben. I do want to come back to the for being polite. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to come back to the definitions comment because I will say uh, there is you you rely more on uh, the scholastic definitions and Julie's relaying contemporary definitions of terms, and before you interject, let me explain what I yeah. am getting at, because it's not a definition problem at its core, um, but unfortunately, whether it's accurate or not, in contemporary literature and philosophy of mind, um, the Thomistic view is lumped in with dualism. It is. Because, I mean, it is. Oderberg, um, Faser, I mean, they, they, and they, yeah. um, whether or not they call them, whether or not they are accurately described as dualists, yeah, other right. philosophers refer to them as that because the contemporary philosophy of mind, for better or worse, has a, if you think of it, it's sort of like a line. On one side's materialism, other side's pantheism, dualism somewhere in the middle. This is what um, people define things as. And so, fairly or not, dualism, Thomism is thrown in with dualism, whether that is an accurate name for it or not. But that's the sense in which dualism is being used here. I, I think it's, I can follow this in one fell swoop. Define dualism. <laughs> so I, my, my point was well, that we that did. Still yeah. So her description is talking about yeah. philosophy. From what I, I would say dualism is, means that there's two substances to the human person. No, and so I, if, as okay, you so know, that, my the, the, my that's the, um, that's the whole crux. That's, of a, that's what I was saying. Where the defi that's what I was trying to get at with the definitions is how you're defining dualism seems to be what the issue is. It's not necessarily that y'all are. But that's okay. That. Open your mind a little bit more to a broader view of it. Christiana. Dualism, God created and redeems humans as embodied persons. He sustains us disembodied between death and bodily resurrection. And that's very general. So, okay, okay, okay. But I will say that when arguing against transhumanism, a Thomistic, holomorphic view of the human person is the best way to go. Because if you're Cartesian, and the body is not essential, then the disembodiment that transhumanists offer, should, why would you have a problem with it if you're essentially your soul? So on, on Thomistic dualism, sorry, um, then there's more integration. The soul is the form of the body, and there's more integration, and it can't be torn apart like that with, uh, in other words, for the transhumanists to say that um, we're going to be rid of our bodies and we'll still be uh, ourselves is, you know, not going to, it's not going to work on the Thomistic view. So that's why I, that's why I like it and that's why I would say it's the best version to uh, counter or be contra to transhumanism. So the takeaway, which we, let's see. is just that biblical holistic dualism best accounts for the essential features of human persons. First person consciousness is rooted in the soul. 
And a subject is essential for reasoning, understanding, judgment, just like we talked about, intentionality, imagination, unity of consciousness. And there's an enduring self or identity. The future you really is you. And remember last week we determined that really on transhumanism, on the materialist view, the future you isn't really you. So that's it. Thank <laughs> you.